Hi, welcome to Chemical Reactions. My name is Dr. English, and today we're going to continue our conversation on double replacement reactions. So this is part two. Today we're going to be looking at soluble versus insoluble compounds using reference table F to determine solubility, double replacement reaction practice, and then some more double replacement reactions. So buckle up. It's a long video, but there's lots of examples. Soluble versus insoluble compounds. Soluble is defined as a compound that will dissolve in water. It will break down into positive and negative ions. If something is called insoluble, this is a compound that does not dissolve in water and will remain intact when added to water. Here is our New York State Physical Setting Reference Table F. And there is a lot going on in this table. So we're going to look at this table and we're going to divide it into two parts. I'm going to say this is the box on the left and this is my box on the right. So let's focus on the box on the left. In this box we have ions that form soluble compounds. So here we see the word soluble. Soluble means that if your compound has one of these ions in it, it will dissolve in water. Now there's this column, and right next to it is the exceptions column. So any of these ions down here, if they are combined with any of the ions over in the far left column, they will form insoluble compounds. So what do I mean by this? All right, let's look at group one ions. Group 1 ions, which include examples like lithium and sodium, so basically anything in group 1. If those ions are in your compound, it's going to dissolve in water. Absolutely. You see sodium, it's going to dissolve in water. And there's no exceptions to the rule. No exceptions. So anything with a group 1 ion in it will be soluble. Therefore, it will not form a solid. Hands down, no solid. Or if your compound has ammonium in it. Ammonium is NH4 plus 1. And remember, that is also listed on table E. So another reference point. Any compound with the ion ammonium in it will also be soluble in water. There is no exceptions to this rule. Next, nitrate. Nitrate is NO3 minus 1. Any compound that has nitrate in it will dissolve in water, and there's no exceptions to that one either. This continues on with acetate. Notice they list both forms here, both the inorganic and organic form, hydrogen carbonate, and then chlorate. So any of these ions, if you see an ionic compound and one of these ions appears, it's going to be soluble in water. It will not form a solid. It will not precipitate out. Then we have the halides. Remember the halides are basically your halogens. They're coming from group 17. A couple of them are listed. The majority of the time, these are not going to form a solid unless you combine them with silver plus one, lead plus two, or dimercury. And dimercury is a polyatomic and is also listed on table E. Say I had sodium chloride. Sodium chloride would be soluble because it has a group 1 ion. But if I have silver chloride, silver 1 chloride, that's going to be insoluble. It is going to form a solid because it will have Ag plus 1 as part of its composition. So the column on the far left, no solids formed. The column on the right in the left-hand box, will form solids, will form solids. Same thing goes for sulfates. Sulfates typically are going to be soluble in water unless they are bound with either Ag plus 1, Ca plus 2, Sr plus 2, Ba plus 2, or Pb plus 2. So again, sulfates, typically soluble, won't form a solid unless they are hooked up with one of these ions in the bottom of this column. Let's look at the box over on the right. These are ions that form insoluble compounds. In other words, will form a solid, will form a solid. 
And again, we have exceptions to the rules. And you're going to notice that a lot of these exceptions correspond to the box on the left. So it actually makes sense. Let's look at the first one. Carbonate. Carbonate is CO3 minus 2. Carbonate, typically in compounds, will be insoluble. So in other words, will form a solid. The exceptions to the rule for carbonate is when it is combined with a group 1 ion, like sodium or lithium or ammonium, which makes sense because when we look back in the left-hand box and we look at the group 1 ions or ammonium, there is no exceptions to the rules. If those ions are found in those compounds, they're going to be soluble, no solid formed. Let's look at the next one. Chromate, CrO4 minus 2, typically insoluble unless it's combined with a group 1 ion calcium, magnesium, or ammonium. So when you come across a chromate, it is worthwhile to check on table F to make sure that your compound, it might be soluble. It absolutely might be soluble if it has something from group 1, calcium, magnesium, or ammonium. Phosphate, also insoluble, PO4 minus 3, unless it's combined with a group 1 ion or ammonium. Noticing a trend here, anything with a group 1 ion or ammonium will not form a solid. Will not form a solid. Will not form a solid if it's in this column. Sulfide, S minus 2, is insoluble unless it's combined with a group 1 ion or ammonium. And finally, hydroxide, OH minus 1, typically insoluble, will form a solid unless it's combined with a group 1 ion, calcium, barium, strontium, or ammonium. So those are the exceptions to ions that typically are insoluble and will form a solid. So let's ask ourselves the question, are the following compounds soluble or insoluble? So let's remind ourselves here, the box over on the left, these are typically going to form soluble compounds. In other words, no solids. The box over on the right, right here, is typically going to form insoluble compounds. In other words, they will form solids if they are part of an ionic compound. So let's look at our four compounds below. LiBr. Is this soluble or insoluble? So we see lithium, and we know that lithium is a group 1 metal. And here it is right here, lithium. So it falls under the category of ions that form soluble compounds. We don't even need to look at the BR because as soon as we see a group 1 metal, we know that it's going to be soluble. So I'm going to put an S for soluble. How about Na2CO3? Again, I see a group 1 metal. As soon as I see that group 1 metal, it's going to be soluble. Now you might say, but Dr. English, the CO3 is right there, and the CO3 falls in the insoluble list. This is true, but remember, you look over at the exceptions, and the exception is it's soluble when it's combined with a group 1 ion, and sodium is definitely soluble. Let's look at the next one, CaCO3. Now, calcium shows up in a bunch of places on here, but it's not distinct about whether it's soluble or insoluble. Sort of depends. But the CO3 minus 2 polyatomic is right here. That falls under the insoluble compounds. So CO3 minus 2 is insoluble, but let's check our exceptions. Maybe CA is over there. The exceptions list when combined with a group 1 ion or ammonium. Calcium is group 2, so therefore this is insoluble. How about SrSO4? So the sulfate SO4 is listed here typically soluble unless it's combined with silver, calcium, strontium, barium, or lead, and oh look, there's strontium. Strontium is part of that list, therefore it is an exception. So Sr, SO4, will be insoluble because remember, if it falls into this column right here, it will form a solid. Here we have two reactants, AgClO3 and Na2SO4. The first thing that I'm going to do is to take each one of my reactants and break them down into ions. So AgClO3 is going to be broken down into Ag plus 1 and ClO3 minus 1. 
Na2SO4 is going to be broken down into Na plus 1 and SO4 minus 2. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to have them switch partners. So the Ag plus 1 is now going to go with the SO4, and the Na plus 1 is going to go with the ClO3 minus 1. So my first product was going to be Ag plus 1 and SO4 minus 2, and then I'm going to cross them down, and I'm going to get Ag2SO4. So now the question is, is this soluble or insoluble? Typically, SO4 is soluble, unless it's with something like silver, because we can see it here on table F how this works. So this would be insoluble. Let's look at our other product. So we're going to have Na plus 1 with ClO3 minus 1 to give us NaClO3. And again, is this soluble or insoluble? As soon as I see that group 1 ion, I know it is soluble, so I can put an S. Now I'm going to write the products of my equation. So I have AgClO3, Na2SO4. One of my products is going to be Ag2SO4. And my other product is going to be NaClO3. That's an oxygen. So will it occur? Yes, it will. And how do I know it's going to occur? Because I formed a solid. Because I formed a solid, the reaction will occur because it's being driven forward by that reaction of producing a precipitate. Let's try another example. NaCl plus PbHCO3 2. Again, I'm going to start out by taking my reactants and breaking them down into positive and negative ions. So the NaCl is going to be broken down into Na plus 1 and Cl minus 1. The PbHCO3 2 will be broken down into Pb plus 2 and HCO3 minus 1. Now I have to pick what product I'm going to start with. I think this time I'll start with Na plus 1. And I know that the Na plus 1 is going to go with the H. CO3 minus 1. Plus 1 and minus 1 cancel each other out. So I'm going to have NaHCO3. And then I ask the question, is this soluble or insoluble? And I know because the presence of the Na that says, hey, that's a group 1 metal, so that will be soluble. So I'm going to put an S here. My other product will be between Pb plus 2 and Cl minus 1. Again, I'm going to cross these down, and I'm going to get PbCl2. This is insoluble, and I know it is insoluble because if I look on table F, I can see that chlorides are typically soluble unless they are with lead. So as soon as they're with lead, they're going to form an insoluble product and form a solid. So I'm going to finish my equation here. So I'm going to have PbCl2, and NaHCO3. It really doesn't matter what order they go in. And again, will the reaction occur? Yes, it will. It will occur because I am forming a solid. Now, I forgot on the previous example to balance the equation, so make sure you go back and balance that thing. I'm sure you can figure it out, but let's balance this one just to make sure that we're doing it correctly. So I have two chlorines on my product side. I need to put a 2 in front of here, so now I have 2 chlorines, 2 chlorines. Now I have 2 sodium on my reactant side, so I need to put a 2 in front of here. So now my sodium is balanced, and then the hydrogen carbonate exists as one entity. I see that I have 2 of them over here, and this 2 in front of the NaHCO3 balances out the 2 hydrogen carbonates over here, and finally I have the lead. So I have one lead on my product side, one lead on my reactant side, and it is balanced. Let's try another one. Calcium hydroxide with phosphoric acid. CaOH2, I'm going to break that down into Ca plus 2 and OH minus 1. Phosphoric acid, for the sake of keeping it simple, we're going to assume full dissociation, even though I know some of you out there are like, but it's a weak acid, it's not going to fully dissociate. 
don't worry about that right now. We're good. So we're going to say my ions are H plus 1 and PO4 minus 3. Again, I'm going to produce my products. So I'm going to take the Ca plus 2 and I'm going to put that with the PO4 minus 3. That should be a 2 right there. Then I'm going to cross them down. So I'm going to do Ca3 parentheses PO4 2. Now the question is, is this soluble or insoluble? We know that by looking at table F that it will be insoluble. Phosphates are typically insoluble unless they're with a group 1 metal or ammonium. And in this case, that's not the case. We're with calcium, so this would be insoluble. Now let's look at our other product. Our positive ion is hydrogen. Our negative ion is hydroxide. And you put them together, what do you get? Hey, you get water. So now the soluble insoluble situation really applies to whether you have an ionic compound that forms a solid or not. Here we have a molecular compound. So this is really not going to be answered, but we have a molecular compound here. And we know that one of the driving forces of a double replacement reaction is the production of a molecular compound. Now we need to balance this double replacement reaction. So I'm going to start with the phosphate. I have two phosphate ions on my product side. So I need to get two phosphates over on my reactant side. So I'm going to put a two in front of the H3PO4. Then I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to balance my calciums next. I have three calciums on my product side. So I need to put a three over here. And the reason why I did this is because there's a lot of hydrogens and oxygens all over the place. And I need to pay really close attention to make sure that I've caught all of them. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to look at my hydrogens. Over on the reactant side, I have six hydrogens as part of the CaOH2, and I have six hydrogens as part of the 2H3PO4. That collectively gives me 12 hydrogens. In order to get 12 hydrogens over on the product side, I need to put a six in front of the H2O because that will now give me 12 hydrogens. Now I'm going to hope that all of my oxygens have worked out. So I have six oxygens here, and I have three times two gives me six oxygens right here. And I know the other oxygens have already really been accounted for as part of the PO4 polyatomic. So my final answer should be in this balanced equation, three CaOH2, two, H3PO4 yields 6H2O plus Ca3PO4 2. Let's do another one. K2CO3 BaCl2. For the K2CO3, we know that's going to be K plus 1 and CO3 minus 2. BaCl2 is going to be Ba plus 2. Cl minus 1. I need to make a product. So let's do K plus 1 and Cl minus 1. The formula is going to be KCl. That is definitely soluble. That's a group 1 metal there. Then I'm going to have Ba plus 2 and CO3 minus 2. My formula for this is going to be BaCO3 and that is insoluble. So my final equation will be K2CO3 plus BaCl2 yields KCl and BaCO3. Does the reaction occur? Of course it does because I formed a solid with that solid being BaCO3. Finally, I need to balance this. I have two potassiums on my reactant side. I need to put a two in front of here. So now I have two KCLs. That means two CLs. I have two CLs over here. 1 CO3, 1 CO3, 1 BA, 1 BA. Hey, it's balanced. Let's move on. AgC2H3O2 plus K2CRO4. All right. AgC2H3O2. I need to break that down into a positive ion and a negative ion. Don't be scared. The Ag is just going to be plus 1. In the C2H3, Three O two minus one all sticks together. It is an acetate ion. Do not break it apart. 
the K2CRO4 will break down into K plus 1 and CRO4 minus 2. My first product, let's start with the AG plus 1. Going with the CRO4 minus 2, I'm going to cross these down, and I'm going to get AG2CRO4. If I look on table F, I can definitely see that that is insoluble, so I'm going to label that as an I. For product 2, I'm going to have K plus 1 and C2H3O2 minus 1. Put them together because they're plus 1 minus 1, and I'm going to get KC2H3O2. This is definitely soluble. How do I know that? Because K plus 1 is group 1 metal, which is always soluble, and acetate, any compound with acetate in it, will also be soluble. So what are my two products? I'm going to have Ag2CrO4 and KC2H3O2. Will it occur? Yes, it will, because I have an insoluble product. I have formed a solid. Finally, I need to balance this. So I have two Ags on my product side, a two here. So I need to put a two in front of here. So my Ags are now balanced which now means I have two acetate ions on my reactant side. So I need to put a two on the product side in front of KC2H3O2. So now that gives me two of those. I have two potassiums on my product side. So now, hey look, there's a subscripted two by that potassium. And then finally, CRO4, one CRO4. I'm in good shape, it's balanced, let's move on. Na2S and HCl. HCl is a strong acid, so it is going to fully ionize, break into a positive ion and negative ion when it's in water. So we can treat it like it's somewhat like an ionic compound because it is a strong acid. So let's look at our first reactant, Na2S. Na is plus 1, S is minus 2. For HCl, yes, I realize it's a molecular compound and it does have covalent bonds, but trust me, it's a strong acid. We can break it down into H plus 1 and Cl minus 1. So my first product, I'm going to start with a positive ion of Na plus 1, and my negative ion is going to be Cl minus 1 to form NaCl. Is it soluble? You betcha. That is definitely soluble because we have a group 1 metal and the chlorine is bound to something that's already soluble. My second product is going to be H plus 1 for my positive ion and S minus 2 for my negative ion. The formula here is going to be H2S, hydrogen sulfide. It is a gas under normal circumstances, so most likely it would sort of bubble out of this reaction if this was occurring. So soluble, insoluble, again, we really use that terminology when we're trying to figure out if something is going to form a solid. We have a gas here. And the other thing, is it's a molecular compound. And when we form a molecular compound, that's going to drive the reaction forward. So will this occur? Yes, because we have formed a molecular compound, and we've also formed a gas. So our two products, just to finish out this double replacement reaction so we can represent it symbolically, we would have NaCl for one of our products and H2S for our other product. Now I need to balance this. I have two sodiums on my reactant side, so I'm going to put a two in front of the NaCl, and these are balanced. I have one sulfur and one sulfur. Two hydrogens, I need two hydrogens here, so I'm going to put a two in front of the HCl. So now I have two hydrogens here, two hydrogens here. I now have two chlorines, and because I have a two in front of the NaCl, I have two chlorines on my product side. And we're balanced. Let's move on. Last one, bringing it home. NaOH, HCl. NaOH is going to break down into Na plus one and OH minus one. HCl, like we saw before, is going to form H plus one and Cl minus 1. So for my first product, I'm going to form Na plus 1 and Cl minus 1. I'm going to form NaCl, and we know from previous examples that this is soluble. And then for product 2, I have H plus 1, OH 
minus 1. And again, from previous examples, we know that this is going to form water. So the soluble insoluble, not really applying to this situation, but we have formed water, which is a molecular compound. Therefore, the reaction is driven forward. So will it occur? Yes, it will, because we formed water. So my two products are NaCl and H2O. Is this balanced? We have one sodium on the product side, one sodium on the reactant side, one chlorine on the reactant side, one chlorine on the product side, one oxygen on the product side, one oxygen on the reactant side, a total of two hydrogens on the reactant side, and a total of two hydrogens on the product side. This reaction is balanced. So what did you learn in this very long tutorial? We talked about soluble versus insoluble compounds. We looked at reference table F to help us to determine solubility. We did some double replacement reaction practice with solubility. And then we did even more double replacement reactions to really drive the point home. Need more help? Feel free to contact me. Have a great day.